Well, as we're, uh, as we're singing, we'll wait on the Lord to, to speak to our hearts and give us answers to the prayer that we're going to be crying out to Him. But uh, as we sing, let's en just enjoy singing, singing, I'll fly away. Think about that day. It's going to be a great, great day. Let's sing together. Oh, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. Oh, I'll fly away. that all
You're son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. That all the world will praise your great name. Who your great name. Just take a moment in prayer to cry out in the great name of Jesus. Lift up your concerns to him for a moment. We're going to keep singing after that. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have the name that is above every other name. Lord, you are ruler of all. You're the king of kings, Lord of lords. You have the world in your hand. You have our problems in your hand. You have everything that we need. You can, t you can take care of it all. Lord, and I, I praise you for that, Lord. I thank you that you have given us an opportunity to know you personally. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood. Thank you for forgiving us. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to forgive one another, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you. Keep speaking to us this evening. All I once held dear Built my life upon All this world reveals And wars to own all I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no grace. I love 
my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. And I love you, Lord. Lord, I agree completely that there is nothing better than knowing you. Lord, I do pray that uh, we would just continue to get to know you even better this evening. Continue speaking to our hearts. Open our, our minds and our hearts up to what, what your word says, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue just to take a few more minutes to, to get to know the Lord even more. In prayer, pray for people next to you or uh, the, the requests that you have. Those of you at home, um, don't go. We're going to get into the Bible study in, in just a few minutes, um, but go ahead and pray at your home. Does anyone have a request they'd like to share with the group? Be praying for our our youth pastor and our youth. They're over in the in the park where they have been every Wednesday evening. Um, pray that their outreach and witness is successful. I stopped by there on the way here, and they were pretty well set with sandwiches and watermelon and and all kinds. So they're 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 in good shape, I think. Please keep in mind that we have a mission team leaving. In what, about 10 days, I guess, something like that? It's a little, little more than that, 11 days. Uh, headed to uh, Alaska to begin praying for the 13 of them. Who's, who's got a headache? Steve, Steve, you got a headache? What? You have a headache? Father, I just lift up my brother to you now in the name of Jesus. We can claim complete healing over this headache, Father. We pray that you would take it from him, that he not be distracted from the task that you've put in front of him. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Rachel, you were going to say? 
a picture of the mission team. Yeah, I guess we could raise those. The Henrys and yeah, before and after. <laughs> yeah. Come back in our hair and all that. We're actually going, uh, considering doing the uh, uh, the Monday night thing live from Anchorage. Uh, yeah, and uh, and I'm thinking we need to get like a little bear thing to hold, hold up in the back. That should, that should be fun. Church unity, always a good prayer. We're going to actually talk about that tonight, coincidentally. Christy. For credence. What was the uh, determination? Okay. Father, we just stop right now in the name of Jesus, and we lift up. First, we pray for little credence. Uh, Father, we pray for her uh, complete healing. We pray for the doctors that you've appointed to her care, that they'd be divinely guided and know exactly how to address um, the issues that they're coming to. Father, we pray for godly wisdom for uh, Christy and Billy as they seek to make uh, medical decisions for their daughter. Father, we, we thank you that credence is in your hands, and you will heal her. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone else? All right. Well, um, the God and Guns Bible Reading Challenge is going swimmingly. We uh, have, I believe, 260-something people um, across the, the nation and even into Canada. We're international. Uh, participating with us, um, my prayer is that everyone make it through all 60 days of the reading um there uh anyone watching uh, there are uh rumors of extra raffle drawing prizes showing up at random times through the 60 days so you don't want to stop reading and then the next day have an awesome drawing happen and you not be qualified for it so keep keep that in mind um but very much enjoying the the experience so from that Bible study, we go to this one. So we're still in Romans, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go all the way back to Romans, start over again. Uh, we, we did verses 12 and 13 last week. Tonight, we're going to try to get from verse 14 all the way to 26, which means we'll have one more week next week in, the, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12. Then we'll be taking the following week off because the mission team will be in Alaska and we won't have anybody here that because it's like our youth pastor and nursery work i mean all, all that uh and luke and rachel no you'll be here then no they'll be gone as well so anyway we're taking that week off and then when we come back we'll be uh starting first corinthians 13 so let me read the text first and then we'll get into this first corinthians 12 beginning of verse 14 uh, i'm reading from the esv bible for the body does not consist of one member but of many if the foot should say because i'm not a hand I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body each one of them, as he chose. If we all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, 
which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So we pick up where we left off last week, which was one spirit, one baptism from verses 12 and 13. And as we look at this passage, it's easy to see. This is a pretty straightforward passage to understand. The imagery is, is, is very vivid. We all understand parts of our bodies that make up one whole body. It's not a foreign concept. So as we read, uh, it, it seems in the surface to be very easy and simple. And, and because it seems that way, that actually could be a problem for us. Because... This passage may, in fact, be too easy to understand and maybe too familiar to us. And I say that not because I want the Bible to be difficult, because I don't, but when we read this story, the image, the picture of the members of the body, Christ as an individual people in the church, sometimes we tend to not actually read all the words that are there. We sometimes just read through it or past it because we have already a general sense of the passage, and then we take that general sense, and then we run with it. And we go immediately into like application mode. What does this mean for me? What does it mean for you? Let's try apply it. And we miss some of the things that were actually in there. So in the process, if we haven't really understood this well, we we'll overlook some of the details of what Paul says. So I want to try to pull them out here tonight. Uh, worse than that, we can perhaps fill in some of the gaps by reading in our own ideas into the passage that might actually be contrary to what Paul is trying to say. So I'm going to give you an illustration of how this passage has been misused in the past. So here's an image of many members making up one body that's not new to Paul. Okay, it's not the first time he's used it. <coughs> this isn't something that he was the first person to sort of used to describe some larger body of people. In fact, if you read history at all, there are many times in history, not biblical history, where different people or philosophers talked about individual groups or a family or a clan or a tribe or a whole nation as individual members of a body. That imagery is not new. It was common, actually. But in the past, when, when people would use that image, the same image that Paul is using here they would use that image to emphasize the importance of the body over the importance of any individual member. As I speak from here, you might want to start in your background, have government in your mind. Okay? So they would use this imagery to show the importance of the body over the importance of the individual member. So the message would be we, we live in a body, so our individual needs, they're not important. The only thing that's important is the good of the the whole. I'm sounding like Star Trek here, isn't it? Or even to take, one, take it one step further, you know what, we're actually just afoot. You need to just be quiet and serve the needs of the head. That's how this imagery has been used in the past. Promoting unity and harmony and quelching any kind of individuality. Ancient cultures, most modern cultures, but not ones in the West, they were collectivists. They exalted the collective, the body, at the expense of the individual members of the body. And that's a very real way of misreading this passage, because you could read this and come away with that. But there's the exact opposite error, too. We're not collectivists. We're individualists. In fact, Sunday, we're going to have a big celebration for that very reason. We're free. What's the day called? Independence Day, we're free, independent individuals. That we have these certain unalienable rights for life, liberty, and what? Pursuit of happiness. And that leads us, with that worldview, to read this passage in a particular way that falls into its own issues as we emphasize the importance of the individual above the body, even at the expense of the body. Do you see the two extremes that this passage can be used? 
So we teach that each foot should dance to the beat of its own drum. We tell every hand today to take for itself whatever it pleases. And for every ear and for every eye, uh, offer personally curated, individualized, endless streams of audio and video to suit your particular tastes. We are a culture of extreme, rampant individualism. We don't abuse individuals so much for the sake of the whole. We emphasize diversity and freedom. And we have such a fractured society because of that, that we're torn apart and divided and factionalized one from another. So we are suffering from this overemphasis of the individual. So whatever culture you're coming from when we approach this scripture, whether it's a collectivist background or, or we're looking at the body of, and sort of, uh, of ignore the individual members or whether we're coming from an individualist background where we look at the individual members and forget the larger body, this passage actually confronts both those assumptions that we don't even know we're making when we're reading the passage. So it's important that we read what Paul says because this word, which is given, as all scripture is, for all times and for all people, it cuts both ways and it confronts both kinds of those errors. So our big idea as we, we read this tonight is, is this. God has arranged and honored every member in the body of Christ. That's the takeaway from these verses. But speaking of arrangement, that's a word to individualists that you can't pick your own arrangement. And you can't go off on your own. You're part of a larger body. And by speaking of every member being honored, well, that's a nod to the collectivist that says that you can't do something for the whole at the expense of a member. Each member is honored in the body of Christ. Three parts to this passage, just like we kind of remember last week. Remember how we did it with just three points last week? So here they are. How we see our gifts, how we see others' gifts, and how we see the whole body of Christ. That's how this breaks down. So those are the, if you're doing an outline, that's how you want to do that. So let's talk how we see our own gifts here uh, first. Uh, we see this. Uh, do not demean your gifts. In the first paragraph, in verse 14 through 20, Paul tells us don't demean our own gifts because we're tempted often to do that very thing. In verse 14, Paul says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So Paul's saying that the body, by definition, cannot be composed of identical members. That's not a body. So you should not be expected to have identical gifts to other people. If the body were one big pile of noses, that wouldn't be a very effective body. You need all the parts working together in coordination to have a working body, right? And he illustrates that with verses 15 and 16. He says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So now, because each member has this unique role to play, what Paul is saying here is that no member should look at another member and envy those gifts. Do not demean your gifts, the gifts that God has entrusted to you. That's one of the places where perhaps we're a little too familiar with this passage. I've never, I never noticed this until I was putting this together. And I can't count the number of times I've read 1 Corinthians, particularly these three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, uh, in my life. But there's a very specific comparison that Paul makes here, and it's a different kind of comparison the one, than the one Paul makes in just the next paragraph. Here, this first comparison is, is between members of the body that are extremely similar. One member compares itself to a slightly more impressive member of the body. The foot doesn't compare itself here to the ear or, or to a different organ or, or limb. What it does is it, it compares itself to a hand. And a hand and a foot, very similar. If, if, if a foot looked at a hand and said, look at all the things that that hand can do. I mean, it's got a thumb. And I can't do those things. Well, if I can't do all those things that the hand can do, well, I guess I don't have a purpose here. And in the same way, the ear compares itself not to a hand, not to an eye. I mean, I, I guess it's cool to hear things at all, but 
what if I could see? Now that's a much closer comparison, just a little bit better. And since I can't see like the eyes do, well, maybe there's no place for me here. One of the commentators, a guy named Leon Morris, he wrote this quote, We are prone to envy those who surpass us a little rather than those who, patently, who are patently in a different class. Don't demean your gifts. Don't look at someone who's similar but maybe outpaces you just a little bit by your estimation. Don't envy the gifts of others and don't demean your own gifts. And then Paul, in verse 17, he, he, he exposes the absurdity of that kind of comparison. In, in 17 he says, If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? So each of us have to be content with our role in the body because each role is not only unique, the Bible says each role is essential. There are ways to be unique but, n but unessential. When I was in my very first year of Little League Baseball, played for a team in White Center, Washington called Nelson's Milk Barn. And I had a very, I had unique talent, which is a better way of saying that at five and six years old, I had none. So my coach had to find a way to place, uh, to, to put me that wouldn't be too essential because that would expose our team to a, a lot of risk. So I played right field my whole first year because not many kids could hit it all the way out to right field at that point. That was how I was unique but unessential. That's how my unessential gifts were used in that particular team. I, by, I did get better, by the way. I, I lettered in baseball in high school. Uh, it's, a very different, it's a very different kind of thing in church, though. The church, is, it, the church is, it's not like that. It isn't that some of us have these unique gifts that, well, I guess we just got to find a way for this person to, to get a participation ribbon. That's not how it is in church. What God is saying in his word is that every single individual soul that walks through the doors of this building, every individual function is absolutely necessary and essential and indispensable in the body of Christ. And failure in any way is on us. And we suffer. So Paul reminds us that the reason for this is not an accident. The body did not work its way together by some strange evolutionary process where all these random parts were in the air and whoop, they all fell together like this. No, what, the body came together by the explicit choice of God himself. Verse 18 through 20. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So if you think about it, to demean our own gifts, what you're really doing is criticizing God's wisdom. To want, some, to want what someone else has is to tell God that he's made a mistake with you, and he hasn't. That's not only a sinful attitude toward God, but it's a problem that, that robs us of the great joy that we should have the great joy that we would have if we were content with what God gave us. I have two dogs at home. And I am amazed, and, and did I say I have a million dog toys in my living room? We have a, a, a bin of toys, and there's two of everything. Because I have two dogs. Now, the first dog may actually have the best toy in the box. But the moment dog number two gets a toy, the toy that dog number two has, no matter how poor of a toy it is, now becomes the most important toy in the box to dog number one. <laughs> like toddlers. And they war, a war breaks out in our, our, our living room every single day. And I think, well, why do they do this? Wouldn't my dogs be so much happier if they were each content with what they had, especially 
when I've gone to so much effort to make sure that everyone has exactly the same. Then I thought, well, you know what? We kind of do the same thing. Wouldn't we all be much happier if we could just be content with the gifts that God has given us? Our Heavenly Father, he's so gracious, so good, so loving. He gives only, the Bible says he gives only good gifts. It says only good gifts come from him. And what he's given you as a gift, it's not a throwaway gift. It's not an accident that you have it. It wasn't like the last possible place that God had to put it. Oh, there's, there you are here. It, it, the Bible says it's God's specific purpose and choice to give you the gift you have. Don't demean your own gifts. Point number one. Point number two, how we see others' gifts. What about the gifts that God gives to other people? If, if that's how we should think about our gifts, what should we do when we look at the gifts of others? How should we evaluate and assess others' gifts? Sometimes our problem is not that we look at someone else and say, oh boy, I wish I had those gifts, and start to envy the person. That's not it. Often when we look at a person and think, I have no idea what that gifts are. And we begin to despise the gift that God has given someone else rather than look for how God wants it to be applied so the next verse verse 21 to 24 he gives us the next instruction he says do not despise other gifts in verse 21 Paul telling us that we should not despise or look down on someone else's gifts he writes the eye now remember before I read this remember then the paragraph before the comparison was between a hand and a foot and an ear and an eye now watch what happens as he writes this is different. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And in those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow a greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So the comparison has changed here. It's no longer between similar parts of the body, but slightly more impressive foot, hand, ear, eye. We're seeing a comparison here, a very different kind. One set of gifts that seems to be stronger versus a set of gifts that seems to be weaker. I, I, I use the word seem, actually, for, for a reason. We'll, I'll talk about more about seeming to be less in a minute. The eye compares itself to a hand. Now, that point of comparison could, I don't know, potentially be the reach of the hand, the reach that the hand has. It, it, it can reach, a hand can only reach for something that's at the end of its arm. But an eye, an eye can see things, you know, however, it's a different but similar kind of comparison. And the head, it, it, it comp it's compared here it itself not to the hand but to the feet because the head is so much bigger than the feet and the feet are always in the dirt right i think paul's using an image here head and eye he's talking about leadership roles in the church those with seemingly or perceived greater gifts paul's saying that those with gifts and roles of leadership should not look down on the members of the church uh, with gifts that seem to be lesser gifts and that applies to every single one of us in the room here. None of us should look down at another person's gifts and another member of the body of Christ and despise what we esteem to be a weaker gift. And he says what seems to be weaker is not necessarily weaker. And don't miss the point in this passage here. In fact, it says those gifts, if we evaluate them, which we, we think to be weaker, he calls them indispensable in the body of Christ. Verse 22, on the contrary... The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So we underestimate their strength. We look upon these things, and they don't seem to be much of use, much function, much power. I mean, what do you do with that gift? And yet God looks at all these things quite differently. In fact, God looks at a bunch of things quite differently. He says that all over in the world. And, uh, in the word, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but what? God looks at the heart, right? So the Lord gives these specific gifts that he wants to be used in, the, in a specific way in which they are to be used because every gift is indispensable in the body. 
And not only does Paul warn us about despising seemingly weaker gifts, he goes one step further than this. In verse 23 he says, And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. So he's saying there that these gifts in the body of Christ, which outwardly are not that impressive, and they don't accumulate a whole lot of praise from people looking on them, what, what Paul says is that we should be giving greater honor to those who labor faithfully in very humble circumstances than we do. Last week, if you remember, I encouraged you all, and someone actually encouraged me, and I appreciated it. I encouraged you all to find someone and encourage them in using their spiritual gifts. Remember? That's what I left you with. Find somebody and, and encourage them in using their spiritual gifts. That's what we should be doing all the time, finding ways to encourage other people in the body of Christ. Um, and that's all the true, more true for those whom you recognize whose gifts aren't flashy, not outwardly visible, not obvious to other people. The gifts that actually keep the church running. Paul takes this idea one step further. Not just the weak, or as we seem to be weak, not just to those who seem to have less honor. He goes one step further um, into verse 23 into 24. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So now Paul's talking about these unpresentable parts. Talking about our private parts. I mean, it's, it's in here, I gotta deal with it. So he's talking about our private parts, and, and he's making a point here that we give greater care and greater attention, and we give the modesty to cover those parts, and that does not demean the value of those parts. Rather, our modesty gives those parts greater honor. Do you see it? That the same is true when we talk about the exercise of gifts in the church that most people will never see. So what's he talking about? Well, think particularly about gifts like generosity. One of my favorite gifts in the church. But 99% of the people in the church have no idea where the generosity is actually coming from, and that's the way they want it. That's the kind of person that needs to be encouraged and honored. Another one's prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said that when you give, this isn't a gift that's showing it's, it's flashy that you should do before everybody so everyone praises you and say, wow, you're really a generous person. If you do that, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you've, you've received your reward in full. And he says the same thing about prayer. Uh, that's why you, when, you, when you pray and you don't stand on the street corner and show everyone how eloquent of a, a prayer you are, he said, I tell you the truth, you've received your reward in full. Instead, here's what he says. When you give in secret and your father who sees you in secret will reward you, and when you pray, go to your secret closet and pray there, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So lack of public recognition does not mean that God has abandoned those gifts as worthless. The fact is God himself bestows great significance and reward and honor on those gifts that most of us never outwardly see. Amen? Some of you give endlessly of your resources, blessing others in ways that will never, ever come to light until Judgment Day. Then all the secrets are exposed for good or for evil. Some of you labor for hours and hours in secret prayer, You're using your spiritual gifts that no one else will ever see. Jesus said, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What God says in his word here, but God has so composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Do not demean your gifts and do not despise the gift of others. And then let's look at how we see the whole body of Christ in the third and final section here. Paul tells us actually the, the purpose, <clears throat> why we should work so hard at unity when unity is so difficult to maintain. Uh, it would be so much easier just to give up sometimes and attempt the attempt and the effort at this but paul says in verse 25 and 26 that we must not divide the body there that there be no division in the body 
but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So Paul says, here's the purpose that I'm writing this for. This is the bottom line here. Here's what I'm wanting out of this. Here's your big takeaway. Take there be no division in the body. Don't divide the body. Rather that the members have the same care for one another. The body cannot survive if its various members divide individualistically into groups or factions that care only for their own concerns. Each member needs to care for the needs of all the members, and all the members need to care for each of the needs of each of the members individually. Verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. In suffering or in rejoicing, we stand together, not divided together. Think about what happens when you experience pain in any part of your body? Here, let me draw a mental picture for you. Lego piece. Okay? Everybody have the right picture now? It's, it isn't that you sort of register the pain from a par and think, well, that's tough on my toe or my foot. No. Martin Luther actually has a great line that he's written about this past. He says, See what the whole body does when your foot is trodden on or a finger is pinched? How the eyes look door and the nose draws up and the mouth cries out and all the members are ready to rescue and to help and no one can leave the other so that it means not that the foot or finger is trodden on is pinched but the entire body. When you step on a Lego, it is a full body experience, isn't it? That's what he's saying. When you stub your toe, everything's involved. When you suffer with one part, your whole body suffers together with that part. Our bodies know this intuitively. Our bodies have no part jumping in, into the effort when one individual member is suffering. And, and, and this comes hard for us, I think, to really suffer with someone who is suffering. And it's true with rejoicing, too. It's not just that we're all supposed to be miserable together, though that's part of it. We all have to be able to rejoice together. Another commentator named Thistleton uh, wrote this, that, that he said that it would be absurd to go up to someone who's just won a race and say, I congratulate your leg. He says that would be absurd because we know that in a race, your whole body has to work in a coordinated effort, so your lungs are working and to bring in enough oxygen, your heart is pumping, um, that at the various members, your arms are trying to keep your legs in rhythm, that's the extent of my running knowledge and my body knowledge, but all of this is a corporate, coordinated body effort. So when the legs win, the whole body rejoices together. Good picture. Suffer together, rejoice together. Each individual member's welfare is as vitally important to my, we my welfare as my own welfare is. That's where Paul's trying to lead this church. You have to look at it at, at that way, and if we, we truly believe this, we should have no problem fulfilling the second and greatest commandment, which is love your neighbor as yourself. We should have no problem considering others as more significant than ourselves. And if you're like me, that probably means a lot of work because I know I need it in this area. So I'm praying God continue to knit us together as members of one body in Christ. So what do we do with this? What's the application here? First, submit to God's purpose in your life. Don't demean our own gifts when we look and envy the gifts of others. When we do this, we're despising and, and, and pridefully holding ourselves up against God's arrangement of the various members of the body of Christ. It is God who puts us here. I, a lot of folks come to me and talk about... Uh, church membership and actually what they ask is well you don't mention it very often it's because i believe this passage it is god who brings the members to the church and if anyone's joining the church because of of me or me pressuring them that's not helping anybody amen everything god calls us to do is essential in the body of christ there is no unessential gift in the church If you're a, so a foot, are you serving the body to take it where it needs to go? If you're a hand, are you serving the body with the ability to provide for others' needs? If, if you're an ear, 
Are you serving the body by listening and learning? If you're an I, are you serving the body by serving where the body needs to go? Do you see it? It all needs to work together. The point of all these metaphors, all these images, is not that you need to come, know, come to know precisely what the body part you correspond to. That, that, that's not what Paul's after here. This isn't like an online quiz that you can take to get a personality profile. You need to know what part you play in the body of Christ. Your responsibilities and abilities and relationships. You need to know where you should be serving now. And if you don't know this and you want to know this, understand that this is one of the best things that the leadership of the church can work with you towards. Our deacons, our pastor, our, our other leadership. If you want to know how to serve, please talk to one of the leaders of our church and they will help you find a place. Amen? I'll go ahead and end there. It's 725. Father, thank you that we are several members but one body. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, or the and that you have a plan for us. Help us not to despise the gifts you've given us or look down on gifts that others have and help us be a unified body that there be no division. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.